looking through dark glasses. Looking through dark glasses. Go to 1 Corinthians 13, please. 1 Corinthians 13, chapter. King James, for now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. Now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. We see through a glass darkly, looking through dark glasses. Heavenly Father, you sent me on a mission this afternoon. Lord, I thank you for the joy we've experienced in this house. Thank you for the joy of our young people in the choir. Thank you, Lord, for the faith that you've given to us and the confidence in our salvation and the joy we have in the shed blood of Jesus. What a joy to be protected and covered and our sins washed away and buried. We thank you for all of that. But, Lord, there are people here that are not ministering and living in, in the hope that you have given to us. Lord, I pray that you take off the dark glasses today. Lord, you sent me on a mission, and I want you to help me to fulfill it. Spirit of the Lord, come upon me. Lord, we love your word. We're going to go into the word. I don't preach my mind. I preach your heart. And, Lord, I thank you for the revelation of the word. This is a simple message, Lord, but it has to be heard in the heart. I, I'm asking, Lord, everybody in the balcony and everybody in the main floor and everybody around me on stage, let us hear this in the spirit so that we can be quickened by it. In Jesus' name, amen. And by the way, don't miss tonight's service. You hear what uh, this message that so impacted Pastor Carter Conlon's life. Don't miss this, please. Looking through dark glasses. For now we see through a glass darkly. That does not say we see in a glass, but through a glass. This is not a mirror. This is something we see through. Apparently, the picture here is looking at, at a clouded, dark uh, glass, looking through at an image beyond the glass. Now, of course, that means that we don't know the things we ought to know and will know when Jesus comes. When we're glorified, we'll see everything clearly. But folks, in modern times, I see this as the glasses that many people are looking out at life on. They have dark glasses. It's been said that an optimist is one who looks at life through rose-colored glasses. A pessimist is one who looks at life through dark glasses. I, I think all my life I've been what you call a pessimist. I've always looked on the dark side of things until recent years. God has done a great work in my heart. But I want to talk to you very clearly tonight, this afternoon. There are many people that are sitting here now. Your outlook on life, everything you look at on the job, in your home, everything in your life, every situation, every trial, you're looking through dark glasses. You've got shades on. You're not seeing it the way God wants you to see it. The Bible says, uh, go with me to Luke 11, please. I want to show you something before we go any further. The 11th chapter of Luke. Folks, I'm into a lot of the word today, but I want you to get it from the scripture. Luke 11 chapter, verse 34, beginning to read. Luke 11, 34. The light of the body is the eye. Therefore, when thine eye is single, it means clear. The Greek is clear. When your eye is clear, thy whole body also is full of light. But when thine eye is evil, and that means murky or clouded, the body also is full of darkness. Take heed, therefore, that the light which is in thee be not darkness. In other words, make sure that the light inside of you, the revelation God has given you, is not clouded by your murky eyes. You're not letting that light come out. You're not seeing the way God wants you to see. Now, what do I mean by looking out of dark glasses? I mean it's looking at life. Listen to me now. It's looking at your life and all its situations without hope. Without hope. For example, your marriage. How are you looking at your situation? Many, many, even sitting here now. I, I, I have no way of knowing how many are in what you would call a difficult marriage. A marriage that is not satisfying to you and in fact you look at it and what the eyes that you see through and the dark glasses that are on your eyes right now there is no hope you say i can't make it i've tried it and i hear this so often anymore even from people who attend this church christians both husband and wife christians and i hear it said i i, I guess we're not in love anymore 
We try and we just don't communicate. We don't talk to one another. And when we do, we're always hot and bothered by one another. And it, it just seems, I hear it say, Brother Wilkes, I just don't see how our marriage can make it. And, and, and it's all over as far as I'm concerned. Well, of course it's all over. Of course it's the end of the road. The way you're looking at it. The eyes, the, the clouded glasses that are on your eyes. Of course you can't make it. Because you're looking at it without hope. You're looking at it without hope. Um, a brother came to me just recently. In essence, this is what he was saying. He said, Brother Dave, I had given up on my marriage. I, the way I saw it, it was hopeless. There was no, absolutely no way. And yet I knew that we both had a respect for one another. There was something we could build on. He said, I came home so dejected one day, thinking everything's hopeless. And something happened to me. I said, no, I can't let this happen. My Bible says that God can do anything. Nothing is impossible with God. And something happened. He said, a hope came into me. That if I change, maybe my wife would see that change and want to work things out. And he said, Brother Dave, God dealt with me. I began to see things about myself. And God began to touch me. My wife saw the change. He said, we are making great progress. It looks good. It looks good. It looks good. His his eyes have been changed. The dark glasses are gone. He's not looking through dark glasses anymore. God put hope in his heart. I hear it from teenagers all over this city. I have not heard it from our young people, but there could be some that are sitting right behind me and here in the congregation, a teenager, for example, like the young man who said, listen, he said, I, I live in a poor district in the city. All my life, I've watched my mother. I have no father. I've watched my mother scrimp and save and work so hard just to pay the rent and put some food on the table. There's never been any extra money for clothes. And, and we get hand-me-downs. This is where I come from, nobody drives a car. No teenager has a car except pushers. Young pushers with their gold chains and their, uh, uh, their, their loud uh, bl uh, blasters. But all my life, and this teenager says, there's no money for college. There's no hope for a, a good paying job. Because all my friends have, have come out of school and they're in their 20s and the 30s. They're locked into a, a, a poor paying job and always living on the poverty line. And there's no hope. And folks, we have young people getting in trouble in this city, teenagers especially because there are so few jobs. They, there's no money for college. If, if you're up, uh, in the mi a minority class, another group that is living in a very difficult part of town, unable to find jobs, unable to uh, look into the future and see any hope. They said, where's the hope? And they, because of the hopelessness, so many turn to drugs and they turn to alcohol. And you may be sitting here now looking at your life, saying there is absolutely no future. There are some of you sitting here now listening to me say, Pastor David, I am, in a, I am at a dead end job. There, there's no dream in my life. I don't see any hope of my achieving anything above what I have. I'm locked in. There's not much to rejoice in in my life. Now, some of you go to a job. I, I went with my wife yesterday. When she said, let's go for a walk, she means let's go shopping. <laughs> right? Come on now, you told me. Don't, don't. You went on vacation, you said you went shopping with your wife. All right, okay. He's standing there, so pious, sitting there piously. We were up on Columbus Avenue yesterday, and uh, we had stopped at three stores already. I said, honey, this is not a walk. <laughs> One more store. I stopped in at a lady store, of course, and... Uh, there's a, there's a gentleman standing at the door there. And we'd be, I, I was sitting on a couch waiting. They had some chairs there. And they knew men like me would come in. <laughs> and I'm sitting there 
thinking, why am I doing this? And I'm watching that man at the door. He, he'd been there an hour and he's just standing there. I went up to him and said, how long do you have to do that? He said, six hours at a time. Without a break. I said, six hours? I said, yeah. And, and he looked at me and said, you have to do what you have to do. And, that, and the look on his face, and it's hard to forget it. He said, I am locked in. This is all I have. And that's probably all I'll have. And there was a hopelessness about it. And folks, there are some of you right now. You are looking at your life through these dark glasses. You see absolutely no hope of change. Now, folks, that's sweeping over the country. And yet my Bible said we are not as those who have no hope. We are not like the world. Those who have no hope. And, and you look out in, in the world and you see it. the difference between a Christian and a pagan is hope. Because the world has no hope. The pagan has no hope. I don't care how they laugh. I don't care how they drink and dance and flit about. The Bible says they're without hope. Folks, what would you do if you didn't know that you were saved and had paradise ahead of you? What would you have? There'd be no hope. But folks, there has to be hope in the children of God. This is the witness. This is the testimony. We have a hope that's set before us. Not only a hope set before us, but we have a hope in this life. We are not hopeless in this life. The burden of my heart today and the, the mission that God, the Holy Ghost, has sent me on is to get your dark glasses off your face. Get those dark glasses off. Now, if you don't soon change the way you look at things, if you don't get that clear vision of someone that is fully trusting in the Lord, Believing that God knows who you are, where you're at. He has your address. He has your address. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. He numbered every hair on your head. He knows all about you. He has not forgotten you. But if you continue to look at your marriage and look at your life and your job and everywhere you look, you see darkness. There's no hope. The Bible makes it very clear that you have to snap out of that. You have to change. You cannot go on that way. Because it's very, very dangerous. <clears throat> the scripture says, by the multitude, th this happened to Israel, by the way. Isaiah came to the Israelites and he said, by the multitude of thy ways, thou hast wearied thyself. For you have said, it is hopeless. It's hopeless. They, they had become weary of, of all of the discouragements. Israel had become so weary of all the battles and all the struggles. He looked at God's people and he said, you have wearied yourself. And you're going through your day, day by day now saying it's hopeless. There's no hope. And then he goes on. He says, you no longer reverence the Lord. This is Isaiah 57. I'm reading verse 11. You no longer reverence me. The Bible says also it has made you afraid. It has wearied you. You went straightway to others for help. You'll find that in verse 9, 57, 9. And here's the tragedy. Here's what happens if you don't get hope. If you don't take those glasses off and look at life through faith in Jesus. Unless you can believe that God has a plan for you. That God has something good prepared for you. If you look at it negatively, all you do is talk negative. You speak negative. You live negative. You see nothing but negative. You see nothing but darkness ahead of you. If you don't come out of that... The scripture says not only will, will weary you, the scripture says that you will not reverence the Lord anymore because you'll feel he's forsaken you. Others are being blessed all around you. And here you are forgotten, absolutely forgotten. No money, no future, no hope. But the Bible says you will turn to the flesh for help. You'll turn away from the Lord. You'll turn to others. You'll try to make of God away from God and out of his will. It's, that's how hopelessness affects the human mind. Now, looking out of dark glasses is not an innocent thing with God. In fact, hopelessness is a grievous sin, according to my Bible. It's a grievous sin. The prophet Jeremiah cried, the virgin of Israel has done a very horrible thing. That's 18th chapter Jeremiah, verse 12. And what is this horrible thing that the prophet accuses them of. They have said, there's no hope. He said, you've done a horrible thing. 
You're looking at life now as though it's hopeless. You're looking at your life and your future and you've said, I look into the future, I look at my life, and I have come to the conclusion there's no hope. There's no hope. And then Jeremiah goes on and he said, they have said there's no hope. Therefore, we will walk after our own plans and we will everyone do the stubbornness of his evil heart. Beloved, if you will not ask God by his Holy Spirit to take those dark glasses off your eyes and ask the Holy Spirit to help you look at your life the way the Holy Ghost looks at it and not the way your pessimistic mind may look at it. Or your downcast mind, your mind that's full of doubt and fear and condemnation right now. The Holy Spirit can relieve that, and I'll tell you how in just a moment. But if you don't ask the Holy Ghost to dispel that and take these dark glasses off your eyes, it's very clear here. You will, you will not obey the word of the Lord when you're in a crisis. If it's in your marriage, you'll say, I, I know what the Bible says. I know I'm not to walk out on my commitment, but I can't handle it. I have to go. And you'll do the stubbornness of your own heart. He said, you said no hope. So therefore, you said we will do what our hearts tell us to do. We will do our own plans. And that's when people really get out of the will of God. They don't believe in the miracle. They don't believe that God has an answer to for them. And they, they look at it as absolutely hopeless. And if you continue in that hopeless state of mind, you will end up disobeying the word of God in every area of your life. You will do what feels good, what looks good. You'll take the shortcut. You'll do anything. You'll listen to other people. But you will, you will say, I know what the word says. I love God, but I have to do it my way. And that's what's happening. How many people are in trouble? They are doing things that are absolutely out of the will and the mind of God, ending up in all kinds of messes, all kinds of troubles, doing things their own way because they gave up hope. They just said it's useless, it's hopeless. Oh, God help us, it's not an innocent thing. <clears throat> I'm telling you now, you're really not alive. You're truly not alive if you don't have hope. If you're looking through dark glasses, you still have grave clothes on. I want to show you, this is something Holy Spirit <clears throat> opened to me this past week. I want you to go to Ezekiel 37 in the Valley of Dry Bones. Ezekiel 37. Now, very familiar passage of Scripture. Ezekiel uh, is, is uh, called by God to go out in a valley of dry bones. Now, folks, listen to me, please. The, the, some people have a very vivid imagination. What they see are bleached bones laying all over the field. That's not it at all, because the Lord says, this is the house of Israel, and I'm going to bring them out of their graves. This is a graveyard. It's a massive graveyard. Uh, there were no tombstones uh, there because they were just markers. And under the ground, <coughs> buried in these graves, in these caskets. The, the, here are just a valley full of grave, a huge graveyard and all the bones. And in those caskets, the, the bones have become disjointed. There's no flesh and the bones have just fallen apart. And the, these bones are laying in these caskets. The, as far as the eye can see, this huge valley of graves. And the Lord comes along and he says, speak to those bones and those bones start coming together. And then he speaks again and the flesh comes and covers the bones and flesh comes. What a wonderful thing. And then he prophesies to the wind and the wind comes and blows life into them. This is a picture of what the Lord did for you when he saved you, isn't it? You were in a, you were in a casket of despair and sin, cut off from God and life itself. You weren't living. You were dead in trespasses and sin, the Bible said. And the Holy Ghost breathed on you and he breathed life into you. Here, here are these people now that uh, they, they are, uh, they've got bones and life is pulsating through their veins and skin has covered these bodies. Isn't that wonderful? Now they're alive. 
They are able to uh, move their muscles and their arms and flex. They have hair on their head. Their eyes can see. Their ears can hear. They have a heart that's pumping blood. They are alive. But look what happens. This is an amazing thing. In verse uh, Ezekiel 37, why don't you go to verse 11 here. If I can find 37, here it is. And then he said unto me, verse 11, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried and our hope is lost. We are cut off for our parts. In other words, there's no hope. There's no hope. We're at the end of the rope. We are absolutely cut off. Now, folks, isn't this amazing? Here, here, is, here is a whole <clears throat> picture. The, the Lord has come to them with a message. He said, there's life. You're not going to, to, to continue in that condition. And this is the most glorious promise. The house of Israel. I give you life. Abundant life. They're, they're already given the promise. They're already... God said, you are alive. House of Israel. And they're coming along and said, we have no hope. They're still in their graves. They're still thinking death. They're talking the way we're, they, they're talking the way they did before death claimed them. They're still seeing death. They're talking death. They're living death. Folks, God's not interested in bringing you out of your grave of sin and putting his life into you. So that you can just go around talking death. That is no testimony. There's no testimony for you to look out of eyes that see nothing but darkness. You cannot enjoy the life that he's given to you. You cannot see it. You cannot feel it. You cannot touch it. He's not interested in that kind of testimony. That's no testimony for somebody to say, the Lord saved me, but I'm hopeless. The Lord saved me, but I have no future. Oh, I've been saved and baptized with the Holy Ghost, but I don't see anything good ahead of me. God's not going to raise people out of the graves. He's not going to call them out of the graves just to be that kind of a death testimony to the world. Never. I've been, I've been lovingly rebuked by the Holy Spirit. I'm not saying that you have to go around with a, that, I call the Colgate grin on your face. A, a silly grin that's not from the heart. In fact, they, uh, they, they ask Christian, uh, they ask in China why the Christians lost their smile when they got saved. And the Christians said, well, the custom of the, of the Chinamen is to have a forced smile all the time. Every time we smiled, it was forced. When we got saved, we didn't force it anymore. We have the joy of the Lord, but we didn't have to put on that false face anymore. God doesn't want a false face. He wants the joy of the Lord in your heart. But he wants to take off those dark glasses. These people have flesh. They have bones that have come together. They have flesh. They have life. But they're without hope. Folks, we've got a church like that today. All over the United States. So many that God is raised from the dead. And so the Lord comes along. And he says, therefore prophesy unto them. Thus saith the Lord God. Oh, my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves and bring you to the land of Israel. You shall know that I'm the Lord when I've opened your graves, oh, my people, and brought you up out of your graves. Folks, it's time to get out of that grave. You've been in that grave long enough. You said everything is hopeless. Your marriage hopeless. Your job hopeless. Everything hopeless. That's graveyard talk. That's the talk of somebody still in the grave, still in the casket. I could have called this message living in a casket. Have you ever been around somebody that's already talking death? It'll bring death. You sit and listen to people so muttering and complaining all the time. Everything is bad. Everything is gloomy. Everything is this and that. But there's no joy. There's no talk of faith. There's nothing good. I listen to some Christians and I wonder if God has ever done anything good for them. I wouldn't want to serve a God who treated people the way they sound like they're treated. Poor commercial for Jesus. Folks, come on. Today, this afternoon, you come out of your grave 
of despair and hopelessness take off by the power of the Holy Ghost those dark glasses and say, Jesus, I want the light in me to be a pure light that comes out a fresh light. And I want to come out of clean eyes, pure, clean eyes of hope and not despair. They say, we're all dried up. It's They've just been resurrected. And they're saying, we're all dried up. It's hopeless. It's the end. No, it's not the end. It's just the beginning. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. I'll bring you up out of your graves and it shall put my spirit in you and you shall live. Verse 14. And I shall put my spirit in you. You shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then you shall know that I am the Lord that spoke and performed it, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. Look at me, folks. Why do you think God gave you the Holy Ghost? Why do you think he gave us the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not the gloom of God. He's the joy of God. Hallelujah. If you, if you are walking through life, looking at everything dimly, everything negatively, never rejoicing in the goodness of God. Folks, the one thing that you have, you should start rejoicing. And it should be the, the source of joy every day is that you're redeemed. That, that you are not as the world, that you are not going to die and go to a godless hell. You're going to spend eternity in the arms of Jesus. That's, that's the blessed hope that we have in Christ. You begin with that. You start rejoicing in that. There was a time when I was a young preacher, every, everything, anytime somebody brought me a word like, you know, my son was in a crash first. Oh, he's dead. He's dead. He's dead. Well, I got there, it wasn't a scratch on him. My wife had cancer, and then when Debbie got cancer, I got the word she was down in Houston. That's it. That she's dead. And, you know, I was talking death, not waiting on the Lord to get that, that, that sweet assurance of the Holy Spirit that God has everything under control. And folks, I just got tired of those dark glasses one day. I got tired of talking such despair because I was bringing everybody around me down. I, I remember uh, I, I used to talk all the time. This is about 15 years ago. All I would talk about was, uh, now folks, I still prophesy and I believe everything God told me to preach and prophesy. I'm not taking any of that back. But when we would get around preachers, they would start probing me and and uh, talking about what's coming. And, and all I talked about was 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 collapse and ruin. And and one preacher, I remember his dear friend of mine, he got up, he said, David, I believe that, too. But he said, do you have any joy? I said, yes, I do. But he said, let's speak it. And that's when God began to deal with me. When, when, whenever people are downcast and everything, tell the word, preach the truth. Some of these things, folks, are so sharp and they're so cutting and they're so reproving. And that's what we have to have. We have to have that reproof. But God began to teach me. All right. But always, before you close your message, bring in the hope. Bring in the hope. Hallelujah. And if, if you, ever since I've been in this pulpit, I have never preached to my memory a negative message or a hard message, what was a hard reproving message without bringing the good side. Because we have to have that hope. We have to be able to look through those eyes with hope. I would say to that young person that God knows where he's at. God's made a covenant with that young man. If you'll serve with all his heart, God will do him good. I'm, I'm going to read it to you. Uh, it, it's a, uh, <clears throat> in fact, I want you to turn with me to Psalms 146, talking about the good part. Psalm 146. See, folks, if, if, if you want happiness, I mean, the true happiness of the Holy Spirit, then you've got to come to this place of hope. Hope is what produces that happiness of the Lord. And in fact, this chapter brings it out. 146. It's only 10 verses. Read the whole chapter. Praise ye the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. While I live, will I praise the Lord. I will sing praises unto my God while I have any being. 
Put not your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man in whom there is no help. His breath goeth forth, he returneth to the earth. In that very day his thoughts perish. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Now, folks, here's why he had hope. He said, I serve a God who made heaven, earth, and the sea, and all that there is in it, which keepeth truth forever. Now, look at for just a minute. He says, here's how you can have hope. Because the God that you serve created the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it. And if God can create the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in it, God can create a good future for me. God can change things for me. I serve a mighty creator God. That's why it's tied into him. Seeing him is all powerful. Hallelujah. Which executeth judgment for the oppressed. Which giveth food to the hungry. The Lord looseth the prisoners. The Lord openeth the eyes of the blind. In other words, God takes off those glasses. The Lord raiseth them that are bowed down. The Lord loveth the righteous. The Lord preserveth the strangers. He relieveth the fatherless and the widows. But the way of the wicked he turneth upside down. The Lord shall reign forever, even the God, thy God, O Zion, unto all generations. Hallelujah. Folks, I, I have to confess to you that I've had a holy indignation lately burning in my heart. And it's a holy indignation about the subjective way so many Christians are living, rather than living in dominion and authority. My Bible makes it very clear. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Luke ten nineteen. Behold, I give you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. We need to stop right there and say, then why aren't we living? Is that just a suggestion? Is this just hyperbolic? Is this just talk? Or is this the living word of God? I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Why aren't we taking that authority in our home? Why do we have to be so subjective to everything around us, our conditions and every crisis that we fear man? We fear that God has forsaken us. No, the scripture says, I have given you power and authority and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Nothing. Romans 5.17 They which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Listen to me. They shall reign in life, not in eternity. They, we will rule and reign with Christ, yes. But he says, they will reign in life. That word reign, they shall live as a king with authority. That's what the Greek means. My people shall live as those who have total authority. Folks, we do not have to bow down to every whim and wave of doctrine. We don't have to bow down to the devil. We don't have to give up on our marriages. We don't have to give up on anything the devil would try to take from us because the Bible says we shall reign over him. We shall reign in power. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in your believing that ye may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. You're not just to have hope, you have to have an abounding hope, he said. That's overabundance, all that you would ever need to live in hope. Hallelujah. Wonderful Jesus. The Lord looseth the prisoners. He opens the blind eyes. He raises up those who are bound down with their problems. I can say with David, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart shall be glad and my glory rejoice. My flesh shall also rest in hope. My flesh. This flesh that gets up every morning and looks out at life. This flesh that gets up and says, I've got to go to work today. This flesh that comes into the room to a teenager that's in rebellion. My flesh shall rest in hope. I face a marriage problem. I face a situation in my home. I have to go to a job. I've got to do things and it looks so hopeless. My flesh shall rest in hope. Hallelujah. 
One more scripture. Psalm 33. Psalm 33. Then we're going to go through the audience and take off all your dark glasses. <laughs> Psalms 33. Verse 18, beginning to read. We're going to read the five verses to the end. And if you have King James, I want you to read along with me. Why don't you stand up? You can read standing, I think. I'm reading standing. <laughs> Chapter 33, begin to read verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death, to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waiteth for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Our heart shall rejoice in him. Because we have trusted in his holy name, let thy mercy, O Lord, be upon us, according as we hope in thee. We hope in thee. Glory to God. All these young people behind me, I'll, tell you, I'll look you right in the eye and tell you, right now, God has a beautiful plan for your life. He absolutely does. When God called me, Nobody but God could have found me up in those hills of Pennsylvania, a little town of 1,500 people. I weighed 115 pounds. I've gained 50 pounds since then. Can you imagine? Take 50 pounds off of this body. I was skin and bone. I said, Lord, I'm going to be up in these hills the rest of my life. And God one day said, you pray and I'll make a way. If you'll seek my face, I'll... Open the windows of heaven for you. I'll do the impossible for you. And God said, if you seek me, just give me all your heart. I'll take your life to places you can't believe. He took me to Psalm 25 and made me promises. Who is he that feareth the Lord? Him shall he teach in the path he shall choose. His soul shall dwell at ease. His seed shall inherit the earth. I didn't know I'd write books in 50 languages then. I didn't know anything about it. He said, and the secret of the Lord is with him that fear him, and the Lord will show him his covenant. And he's about to show me his covenant and keep every word he's ever promised me. God found Brother Carter in a smaller town than mine. Glory to God. He keeps blessing him and blessing him and blessing his family. Hallelujah. My God has, has more open doors than there are people. I don't care if you are an orphan. I don't care if your father is not there or your mother is not saved. I don't care what kind of problem you have. I don't care if you have a dime. I don't care if you don't have a college, any money for college or anything else. If you will seek God and put him first, and if you'll have hope and in Jesus and his faithfulness, he will bless every one of you. Not one of you will be left out. Not one. Not one. I'm not promising you a Porsche automobile or Mercedes Benz. I'm promising you a fulfilled life, useful, fruitful in the sight of God. And the most important thing God can give you is who he is and the knowledge of himself. Hallelujah. I'm not done. You will never beg for bread, the Bible says. Never. You always have a roof over your head. And I want to tell you something else. You trust him and quit trying to make things happen. He'll give you in his time and his way. He'll give you a husband. He'll give you a wife. It'll be his husband, his wife for you. You don't have to choose. Isn't that right? Come on. All of you guys, right? You're married. God did it. I told you God did it. God did it. It's said, well, Brother David, I'm 50 years old. And I, I, I'm stuck. <laughs> Listen, with God, nobody's stuck. Nobody's stuck. Nobody's stuck. 
He said, I, I've got pleasures and blessings you never even heard of. Hallelujah. Mm. Hallelujah. All right, it's time to take off the dark glasses. I'm talking about the way you look at things. So, oh God. And folks, one, I told you, one day I got tired of it and I said, no more. And I changed. And occasionally I slipped back. But not very often. And I'm asking you right now to say, God, by your Holy Spirit, take off these sh- shades that are on my eyes. I'm not talking about physical glasses. Those, those awful, awful spiritual darkness. Glasses of spiritual darkness. I want to see you, Lord, as my God. You said, I'll be a God to you. You'll be my son. You'll be my daughter. And he says, I've made a covenant. Oh, one more. One more. The best one I forgot. This is the new covenant. In fact, I'm going to be studying this the next two weeks. And, and this is part of it. I want to read this to you. And if, if, if you'll take this now, it, don't turn. It's Jeremiah 32 and it's verse 40. And this is part of the covenant. Now listen to me with a spiritual ear now, please. And I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good, but I will put my fear in their hearts that they shall not depart from me. I will make an everlasting covenant with them that I will not turn away from them to do them good. God says, I'm going to do good by you. You just seek me with all your heart. And with this, I close. I was in prayer this past week. And every day that I was in prayer, the Holy Spirit came to me. He said, David, if you will continue to seek me as you have with all your heart, your best days are still ahead. And you can't conceive the good that I want to do for you. And that goes for every one of his children. The good. My my mother's mother died when she was 94, I think it was. And she was 89. And she was praying. And you'd think at 89, everything's over. But she'd always wanted to learn to play the piano. So she prayed and God let her have piano lessons. She learned to play the piano before she died. It was just one of those blessings, one of those good things God did for Grandma Martin, 89, playing the piano. Oh, that's a little thing, but God has so many little things that are wonderful things for his people. Hallelujah. Please bow your heads. Lord, this is a wonderful, wonderful hope that we have, that you have a plan You have a purpose for our lives. You have not just thrown us out into this planet to walk our own walk and do our own thing. Lord, you've numbered the hairs on our head. You know every step we take. Lord, you know our going out and our coming in, our down sitting and our uprising. You know every step. Every breath has been monitored by a loving Heavenly Father. And you're not going to let your children strand it. Never. You have a purpose in our lives. Lord, fill us with hope. Remove this darkness from our eyes. Give us hope. Hope for our children. Hope for our marriage. Hope on our jobs. Hope in the church. Hope, hope, hope from the living God. But now, Lord, there are people that are standing here right now. His faith is, and hope has become very dim. And some who have lost hope. I ask you to heal their spirits this afternoon. Amen. Folks, look at me for just a moment. When the elders were praying for the sick and one of the elders came back, I said, how's it going? He said, Brother Dave, a lot of despair. Some of you came up and whispered that that despairing need in your life. If you if if your hope is is waxing dim, or you may be here and say, Well, I, I really been at the end and I've I guess I've lost hope the Lord wants to fill you not just give you a little dab or a little dip but to give you that abounding joy that you can walk out of here with a heart 
just pulsating with his joy and with his hope. Now that requires a confession. Up in the balcony here in the main floor, I want you to come out, get right out of your seat and come up here. I want to pray that God fill your heart with hope. Take away that dark view, that, that hopelessness, that despair. Give it to God. If you're backslidden, if you're running from God, if you don't know the Lord, come with these. No one has to know why you're coming. No one has to know. You come and say, Jesus, I want this to be my day. Change my life. God, give me a new hope. Jesus, give me a new hope in my life. Hallelujah. You that are in the aisles and here in the front, isn't it about time that you changed? Isn't it about time that you spoke faith and lived faith and believed and said, Oh God, I don't want to go through life anymore with this negative, downcast, depressed life. I don't want this anymore. You have to turn your back on that first. You have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. You just have to say, that's enough, Lord. God moves when you, 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 you say, I want to change. I've got to change. Now, folks, that's a commitment you're making right now as you stand here. That coming down here is not going to do you a bit of good unless you're making a commitment right now and saying, look, I have to change. God, I'm going to change by your grace. By the power of your spirit, I want to and I'm going to change. First thing you can do is start talking a different talk. You can say, my God is able from now on. Some of you have been so depressed, you're depressing everybody around you. It's, it's time. I don't care what you're going through. I don't care what anybody's done to you. I don't care. God's bigger than all of it. God is bigger than all of it. Now, let me tell you what's going to happen. Listen to me closely. He's probably not going to change your situation right away. He's going to change you. He's going to pick you up and put you on top of your situation where you can look down on it and say, it doesn't bother me anymore. God wants to bring you up above all your crises and your troubles and your situations and rest in his love. Amen. Are you convinced the Lord loves you? Absolutely loves you. Hallelujah. How many of you that are that came forward have to acknowledge, Pastor Dave, I have said those very words. There's no hope. Raise your hand. There's no hope. I've said those very words. There's no hope. Oh, come on. Everybody said it. Everybody said it. Sometime or another, it's hopeless. It looks so, it looks so bad. Are you willing to admit that? It's so bad, Lord. That's the same thing. It doesn't look good. Well, quit looking at that. Get your eyes on Jesus and keep your eyes focused on Jesus. And that's where you begin. That's where the hope begins to, uh, well, spring up inside when you get your eyes. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking to Jesus. He'll finish the good work that he's begun in you. Are you ready to pray now? Pray right loud with me. Jesus, Jesus. cleanse me and forgive me of all my doubts, my unbelief, my hopelessness. Remove these dark glasses. Take it away that I may see clear that the Lord is on my side. God is with me. And he'll not fail me. I trust you, Jesus. Give me hope. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I give you thanks. I give you praise. I want you to rise up in faith in your spirit right now. I'm going to come against this in Jesus' name. I'm going to take his authority, but you have to agree with me right now. Raise both hands. Raise both hands. In Jesus' name, I come against that spirit of fear. I come against now in Jesus' name. I speak now clearly, powerfully against the spirit of hopelessness. Drive it out, God. Remove the hopelessness. Heal our eyes that we may see. Now, just put your hand on your eyes. Now, these, these are your natural eyes, but Lord, I pray that...
by putting our hands on our eyes, we'll see our spiritual lies. That you will open them. Now, folks, take it off and open your eyes right now and say, Lord, do that in my spirit. Open my eyes. Take away the doubt. Take away the fear. Take away the hopelessness now in Jesus' name. Take it away, Father. We take your authority over this. How many are ready to reign in your life now? You reign and rule in Christ's name. Hallelujah. I want you to repeat this with me. In Jesus' name, Jesus name I, take I take authority. Complete authority. authority. Over every lie of the devil. Every, the devil. every evil suggestion. Every evil suggestion. And every temptation. every temptation. And by faith, by faith I have victory. And authority in every area of my life. Because in Jesus, I am more than a conqueror. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. This is the conclusion of the message. 